Dear students, welcome again to the EduSat learning program. Today we are going to discuss about free charges, bound charges in conductors, insulators, Gauss law in insulators and also about capacitors. Before going to discuss about Gauss law in insulators, let us have a recap over the previous class. In the previous class, we have discussed Gauss law of free charges in CGS system. The Gauss law was having the form integration e dot d s was 4 pi q, where q is the free charge enclosed within the surface. In SI system, it was integration over the surface was q divided by epsilon 0. These charges are the charges enclosed within the surface and using this Gauss law, we have calculated the electric field inside a conductor was 0. Now, let us use the concept of electric field inside a conductor as 0 to find the charges developed on different faces of a conductor. Suppose, we have two conductors one of the conductor is suppose given a charge q 1 and the other is given a charge q 2. Now, let us try to calculate what are the charges developed on each face of these conductors these two conductors have four faces. Let this face of the conductor has a charge of q dash and again this will have a charge of minus q dash. So, if I consider a point somewhere here to calculate the electric field at this point due to all the charges present, the electric field will be 0 according to Gauss law and the four charges producing electric field at this point now can be specified as this has q 1 minus q dash on this face on the face 1 on face 2 it is q dash on phase 3 it is minus q dash and on phase 4 it is q 2 plus q dash, because the total charge on flat number 2 is q 2 and the total charge on first flat is q 1. Now, at this point as we know the electric field is q divided by 2 a epsilon naught due to a plane sheet of charge we have already calculated. So, using this formula we get E 1 due to the first surface is Q 1 minus Q dash divided by 2 A epsilon naught E 2 it is minus q dash divided by 2 a epsilon naught. The negative sign is due to the fact that both the charges are suppose positive. So, q dash will produce an electric field towards left and q 1 minus q dash will produce an electric field towards right both are away from the flats. And similarly, E 3 the electric field due to the third plate third face will be it is again towards. So, it is q dash divided by 2 a epsilon naught and the electric field due to the fourth face will be minus q 2 plus q dash divided by 2 a epsilon naught. 
Now, if I calculate all this, I have taken, I have considered the directions of electric fields by taking positive and negative signs. Since the net electric field inside a conductor is 0 according to Gauss law, so obviously we get the net electric field E equal to 0. So, therefore, E 1 plus E 2 plus E 3 plus E 4 is equal to 0. So, this will give us Q 1 minus Q dash minus Q dash plus Q dash minus Q 2 plus Q dash is equal to 0. So, this implies Q 1 minus Q 2 equal to 2 Q dash or Q dash is Q 1 minus Q 2 divided by 2. So, what is Q dash? Q dash is the charge appearing on the inner face of first plate and also on the inner face of the second plate. Now, if we write the charges on each faces, so my first face will have a charge of Q 1 minus Q dash. So, it is Q 1 plus Q 2 by 2. Charge on the second face is Q dash, it is Q 1 minus Q 2 by 2. Charge on the third face is minus Q dash, it is minus of Q 1 minus Q 2 divided by 2. And charge on the fourth face, it is Q 2 plus Q dash, this is again Q 1 plus Q 2 divided by 2. So, these are the charges they will develop on each face of these two plates. In a specific case, if Q 1 is equal to Q 2, if Q 1 is equal to Q 2 equal to Q, if charges of same magnitude and same polarity is given to two plates like this, then obviously, there will be no charge appearing on the inner faces of both the plates, all the charges will remain on the outer faces. If Q 1 equal to Q and Q 2 equal to minus Q, as is the case for a parallel plate capacitor, we will see later on, you will see that the charges appearing on the outer faces are 0 and on the inner faces it is q and minus q. So, if equal and opposite charges are given to two plates, then all the charges will come to the inner faces, the outer faces will have 0 charge. Let us take another example. If we have suppose three plates, this is my first plate, second plate and third plate. To the first plate, I give a charge of plus q and to the third plate, I give a charge of minus 2 q. Then what are the charges appearing on the 6 faces of these 3 plates? Let the charge on the middle plate is, suppose on this side it is minus q, on this side it is plus q. So, this is minus q and this is plus q and this will be q minus q on this side and this will be minus 2 q plus q on this side. Again using the same concept, you can choose any point inside the three plates, any point. If I choose this point, so what I get? I get the electric field due to 
q minus q first phase is away from the plate for the fourth plate for the third plate it is in the same direction. So, it is q minus q and this is plus q minus q minus q plus q and this one is minus minus 2 q plus q all divided by 2 a epsilon naught must be equal to 0. So, therefore, plus q minus q plus q minus q what we get is 3 q equal to 2 q or q equal to 3 q over 2. So, when small q equal to 3 times capital Q by 2, what we get? We get the charge on the second phase is plus 3 q by 2 and minus 3 q by 2 plus 3 q by 2 minus 3 q by 2. So, obviously, this is minus q by 2 and this is um, q minus uh, 3 q by 2, it is minus q by 2. So, minus q by 2 and minus q by 2 are the charges they will appear on the extreme faces of this combination of 3 plates and we are getting the charges of plus 3 q by 2 and minus 3 q by 2 alternately on the faces of other faces inside the 3 plates. Okay. Now, this is about your parallel plates where the charges are being divided in this fashion applying Gauss law. Now, let us consider 3 concentric spheres having radius A, B and C, where Q is the charge given to the sphere of radius small a, we can say a is less than b is less than c and minus q is given to the sphere of radius c, where the sphere of radius b is earthed. So, let the charge developed on the inner face is my minus q on the outer face of radius b is suppose q dash. So, this will be minus q dash and the outer surface will have a charge of minus q plus q dash. Okay. Now, since the sphere of radius b is earthed, then its potential is 0. In this case, the potential of v is equal to 0. Now, let us try to calculate the potential of b from these charges. Due to the charge on sphere of radius a, the potential on b will be q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 b minus q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 b plus q dash by 4 pi epsilon 0 b minus q dash by 4 pi epsilon 0 c plus minus q plus q dash divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 c and this is equal to 0. Okay. So, what I what I get is q dash divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 b 
is equal to q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 c. So, 4 pi epsilon 0 will be cancelled out. We will get my intention is to find out the value of q dash. So, q dash equal to q into b divided by c. This is very important. So, now the charges are plus q on the surface of the sphere of radius a minus q on the inner surface of radius b and q b by c plus q b by c on the outer surface of radius b and minus q b by c on the inner surface of radius c and minus q plus q dash q b by c on the or q into b by c minus 1 on the outer surface of the sphere of radius c. Okay. So, in this way we can calculate the charges on different surfaces in a combination of conductors by using Gauss law, the concept of Gauss law and also the concept of potential. Now, let us discuss about the free and bound charges in case of conductors and insulators. Conductors where the outermost electrons in atoms are loosely bound and are almost free to move throughout the body. These are known as free electrons or we can say free charges moving around the body. These free electrons are also called conduction electrons. Other electrons which are bound to the nucleus are known as bound charges. Metals, some of the liquids like mercury and ionized gases are examples of conductors. Similarly, in insulators normally we do not have any free electrons. The electrons are tightly bound to their respective nuclei. There are no free electrons or free charges. All the charges are bound. On application of an electric field, the electrons may slightly shift opposite to the field, but they cannot leave their parent atoms. All non-metals are insulators. One thing we should know that if we apply a very high electric field, we may get some field emission, we may get some electrons as well as they are corresponding holes. And this situation is known as the dielectric breakdown for an insulator. The insulator will no more behave like an insulator beyond this electric field. So, therefore, if it is an insulator, then there are no free, free electrons. All the electrons, all the charges are bound charges. Now, the dielectric materials are divided into two types, polar and non-polar. In some materials consisting of your atoms and molecules, monoatomic molecules normally have positive charge center and negative charge center coinciding with each other. In some molecules also, polyatomic molecules also like carbon dioxide having a linear chain where the positive charge center and the negative charge center they are coinciding with each other. Therefore, monoatomic materials and some polyatomic materials like carbon dioxide, carbon tetrachloride, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen etcetera are normally nonpolar. But the polyatomic materials like HCl, water H2O, ammonia, 
etcetera they are initially having poles or we can say they are represented by dipoles because their positive charge center is different from the negative charge center if we think about a water molecule we can say the angle between the hydrogen bond is 104 degree 5 minute and the therefore the positive charge center is different from the negative charge center so it is a polar molecule but whether it is a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule if an electric field is applied the polar molecules are ready to align themselves in the direction of electric field but for a nonpolar molecule what happens is when we apply an electric field the electron cloud this is my nucleus and this is my electron cloud if an electric field is applied now the electron cloud is shifted opposite to the electric field producing a distorted shape of electron cloud with the nucleus shifting towards the electric field so therefore the positive charge center and the negative charge center now are separated by a distance small distance so any atom or molecule now can be represented by an electric dipole so this is because of the polarization so if i apply an electric field in a piece of dielectric may be polar or non polar then suppose the electric field applied electric field is in this direction so this is my e0 now this side we will have the negative charges and on this side we will have the positive charges whereas the electric field due to polarization will be opposite to the applied field now the net field e inside the dielectric will be given by e0 minus ep which is equal to e0 divided by k where k is the dielectric constant of the material now putting the value of e0 and ep if i represent that my e0 is sigma by 2 epsilon 0 ep as sigma p divided by 2 epsilon 0 and e as e0 by k so it is sigma by 2 k epsilon 0 then i get sigma by k equal to sigma minus sigma p or i can have sigma p equal to sigma into 1 minus 1 by k or qp equal to q0 into 1 minus 1 over k so the charge developed due to polarization is equal to q0 into 1 minus 1 by k as we know k equal to infinity for conductors so we will always get charge due to polarization is equal to q0 but for any other dielectric the value of k is ranging from 0 to infinity between any value from 0 to infinity so we will get a different value of charge due to polarization okay so 
using this formula E equal to E 0 by k, we can also calculate the potential inside a dielectric. The intensity of polarization P is defined as the dipole moment per unit volume. Suppose due to polarization in a dielectric, the charge density developed is sigma P and if A is the area of the material and L is its length, then obviously the polarization P is equal to dipole moment it is sigma p into a into l divided by the volume of the specimen a into l. So, this will give you equal to p is equal to sigma p. So, the surface charge density is equal in magnitude to the polarization p. Now, let us try to develop or define Gauss law in a dielectric media. Suppose I have a plate between these two plates I have a dielectric slab of dielectric constant k. Now, if Q is the charge on the first plate and minus Q on the second plate, it is connected to battery and I consider my Gaussian surface like this. So, this is my Q p minus and this is plus q p. So, applying Gauss law in the selected region I get integration E dot d s is equal to q enclosed divided by epsilon 0. So, the q enclosed is q minus q into 1 minus 1 by k because previously we have calculated what is the value of q p, q p is q into 1 minus 1 by k divided by epsilon 0. So, here we get it is q divided by k epsilon 0. So, therefore, integration over the surface k e dot d s is equal to q divided by epsilon 0. Now, I can write this q as the free charge present inside the surface. So, inside the surface we have free charge q and bound charge minus q p. The charges which are developed due to polarization are always bound charges. They are just due to a shift from the center of negative charge or center of positive charge. The charges are not being detached from the atoms. So, therefore, they are bound charges. So, Q is the free charge present here, Q p is the bound charge present here. So, my Gauss law is now modified to integration k e dot d s is q free divided by epsilon 0. Now, for a medium for a dielectric I can write integration k e dot d s equal to q free divided by epsilon or k epsilon e 
dot d s equal to q free. And what is this one? k epsilon e, this is nothing but my d dot d s equal to q free. This is another form of Gauss law, where d is the electric displacement vector. My electric displacement vector d equal to, we can say it is epsilon e plus p. In vacuum, epsilon goes to epsilon 0, p goes to 0. So, I have d equal to epsilon 0 e and k equal to 1. So, these are the parameters of vacuum. So, I have d equal to epsilon 0 e for vacuum. So, putting the value of d equal to epsilon 0 e here, we can generate this formula. So, this is my Gauss law in a dielectric medium. So, integration k e dot d s equal to q free by epsilon 0 or integration d dot d s is equal to q free. So, this gives us a clear cut concept of free charges and bound charges in conductors and insulators. If we are talking about charge enclosed, then we have to consider all the charges present inside the surface. But when we are talking about free charges, then there will be an additional term of k in the left side of the Gauss law. Now, using this concept of Gauss law in a dielectric, let us first find the electric field due to a point charge in an infinite dielectric. To find the electric field due to a point charge in an infinite dielectric, suppose here is a charge q and I have an infinite dielectric. Okay. So, there is a cavity in which a charge q is placed. So, obviously, this is minus q p, the charge due to polarization. I am considering a point p here. To find the electric field at p, to use Gauss law, it can be of two types. We can use the Gauss law of the first kind, we can use the Gauss law of the second kind. Using the Gauss law of first kind, we can write integration E dot d s equal to q enclosed divided by epsilon 0. So, E dot d s integration is how much? It is E integration d s is suppose this distance is r. So, into 4 pi r square it is q minus q into 1 minus 1 by k divided by epsilon 0. So, I will get electric field E equal to q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 k r square. Now, using the second form of Gauss law, now let us try to see whether the same thing is coming or not. If I use integration k e dot d s equal to q free divided by epsilon 0. So, this will give me k e into 4 pi r square equal to q free is q divided by epsilon 0, because within this sphere, Gaussian sphere q is the free charge and minus q p is the bound charge. So, my E equal to q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 k r square. You see, whether you apply Gauss law using the free charge or Gauss law using the 
total charge enclosed, we are arriving at the same result. Now, let us see for a conductor of irregular surface, how the charge density into the curvature is a constant, radius of curvature is a constant. Suppose, we have a, we have an irregular surface and normally what we see that the charges are having a higher population over the edges or over the surfaces where the radius of curvature is minimum. How this is happening? If we consider suppose two spheres, one is having a charge Q A and the other is having a charge Q B, radius is R A and radius is R B and are connected. What will happen? The charges will flow from one to the other till their potentials are becoming same. So, potential of A is Q A divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 R A must be equal to Q B divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 R B. Now, multiplying R A in the numerator of left hand side and R B in the numerator of the right hand side, what we get? It is sigma A R A divided by epsilon 0, this is sigma B R B divided by epsilon 0. Since epsilon 0 is a constant, what we get? We get sigma R is a constant. So, for any surface or any conductors having same potential, if the conductors are at same potential or if a single surface at a constant potential, then the irregularity of the surface is taken care of by the charge density. Here, if we consider the surface of a conductor which is completely irregular, then we will see that the more density of charges will occur at the portions having less radius of curvature and less density will be present at the portions where the radius of curvature is higher. So, if this is my R A and this is my R B, since R A is greater than R B, so this will give you sigma A will be less than sigma B. So, the charge density at A will be smaller than the charge density at B. Let us go to the next slide. In the next slide, we are going to discuss about capacity of conductors and capacitors. In the universe, we have capacity of all substances. A bucket has a capacity may be of 15 liter. We have a capacity of eating some uh, suppose 100 grams of rice. So, everything has a capacity. Similarly, in electricity, all the conductors have capacity of storing charges. If suppose there is a conductor and we give a charge Q to this conductor, as a result, the potential of the conductor is raised to V, then the capacity of this conductor is defined as the charge developed for unit potential difference or unit potential. If I give a potential of 1 volt, the amount of charge developed on the conductor is known as its capacity. The unit of capacity is farad. 1 farad is 1 coulomb divided by 1 volt or this is 1 coulomb per volt. Therefore, knowing the capacity of a conductor, we can also calculate the charge to be developed on that conductor if it is supplied with a potential V and this is equal to 
cv so q equal to cv the capacity of a conductor depends on some parameters of the conductors we will see it later on in different cases the parameters will be different we have three type of capacitors parallel plate capacitor cylindrical plate capacitor and spherical plate capacitor we will see them one by one so before going into discussing about the capacitors in detail suppose i have a combination of plates two plates are there suppose its capacity is 1 microfarad suppose this combination gives a capacity of 1 microfarad and i give a charge of 10 micro coulomb on one plate and a charge of minus 5 micro coulomb on the other plate therefore what is the charge on the capacitor q is q1 minus q2 by 2 if you remember my first problem of this class the charge on the capacitor will be q1 minus q2 divided by 2 so this will give you 15 micro coulomb divided by 2 it is 7.5 micro coulomb knowing the charge and capacity now i can calculate the potential difference between the plates v equal to q by c q is 7.5 micro coulomb and c is 1 micro farad so this is equal to 7.5 volt so in this way using the concept of charge development knowing the capacity of a group of conductors we can calculate the potential difference between them now let us go to discuss about the parallel plate capacitor in detail we get a parallel plate capacitor by taking at least two parallel plates we can also take more than two parallel plates that will give you a gang capacitor that is normally used in radios tv television radios etc so now let us consider a simple case of two conductors or two plates now i connect it to a battery of potential v this is a capacitor parallel plate capacitor consisting of two parallel plates each plate having area a and the plate separation is d now the electric field between the plates this is my positive plate and this is my negative plate the electric field between the plates as i know that is sigma by 2 epsilon 0 plus sigma by 2 epsilon 0 equal to sigma by epsilon 0 because for positive plate the electric field is away from the plate for negative plate the electric field is towards the plate if i consider a point outside the plate as i have already told you the electric field will be zero and on this side also the electric field will be zero so the electric field between the two plates is sigma by epsilon 0 so therefore the potential difference v equal to integration e dx from 0 to d and this will give you since e is a constant this will give you simply the potential difference v equal to e d so this is equal to sigma d divided by epsilon 0 therefore the capacity of this capacitor having plate area a and plate separation d is q divided by v q is sigma a divided by v is sigma d divided by epsilon 
सो इट इज एप्सलन जीरो ए डिवाइड बाई डी सो द कैपेसिटी सी इक्वल टू एप्सलन जीरो ए डिवाइड बाई डी वट वी सी सी इज डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल टू ए एंड सी इज इनवर्सली प्रोपोर्शनल टू द प्लेट सेपरेशन मीन्स मोर इज द प्लेट एरिया मोर विल बी द कैपेसिटी smaller is the distance between the plates more will be the capacity if the space between the plates is now filled with a dielectric if the space between the plates is filled with a dielectric of constant k then what will happen the electric field inside will be equal to e0 divided by k and therefore v will be equal to e0 d divided by k so therefore your c dash will be equal to sigma a डिवाइड बाई ई जीरो सिग्मा डी बाई एप्सलन जीरो के सो दिस इज इक्वल टू सिग्मा सिग्मा एल गो इट इज एप्सलन जीरो के ए डिवाइड बाई डी सो माई सी डैस the new capacity if a dielectric slab of k dielectric constant is introduced between the plates then my new capacity will be epsilon 0 k a by d so what we see that the capacitance is increased with the introduction of dielectric slab between the plates if the space between the plates is not completely filled with a dielectric if the space between the plates is not completely filled suppose we have a dielectric of constant k and thickness t whereas d is the thickness or the distance between the two plates so in this case the capacity c will be equal to epsilon 0 a divided by d minus t plus t by k okay let us consider a situation where a capacitor is charged with a potential v c is the capacity and q is the charge on the capacitor where my q equal to cv and c equal to epsilon 0 a by d okay now since these charges are positive and negative they must be having a force of attraction between them the force of attraction f between the two charge between the two plates will be f equal to charge q into the electric field at that point the electric field is sigma divided by 2 epsilon 0 so this is equal to it will be negative because the force is attractive so minus q into q divided by 2a epsilon 0 so it is minus q square by 2a epsilon 0 the negative sign indicates that the force is attractive so the magnitude of force is q square by 2a epsilon 0 so this is the force acting on the plates due to each other q square by 2a epsilon 0 now let us consider a small numerical suppose between two walls i have a spring and a capacitor connected like this if the spring has a spring constant k 
and the capacitor is given a charge q, then what is the expansion of the spring? Now, the force on the capacitor plates F is q square divided by 2 a epsilon 0, which is which must be equal to k x. So, this will give us x equal to q square divided by 2 a epsilon 0 k, where k is the spring constant. Okay. So, in this way we can calculate the expansion or compression of the spring. Compression will, uh, compression will occur if these two charges will be positive. So, knowing the value of force, we can calculate energy of a capacitor. The energy of a capacitor U equal to F d x integration. So, it is q square by 2 a epsilon 0 integration d x from 0 to d. So, it is q square d divided by 2 a epsilon 0 or this is q square by 2 c. So, energy of a capacitor when charged to q and capacity c is q square by 2 c. In other form, it is half q v or half C v square. So, in this way for a parallel plate capacitor, we can calculate the capacity with and without dielectric, the force between the plates of the capacitor and the energy of the capacitor. Thank you.